Radiant, it's Caleb here, here with this week's Radiant News. Whether today is your first time or you've been here 50 times, I just want to be the first to say welcome. Now listen up for all these wonderful things happening here at Radiant Life Church. Good morning, Radiant. My name is Jeremy Egbro, and you know what time it is. It's time to check in. Go ahead and get out your iPhones, Androids, tablets, smart devices, whatever it may be and head on over to the Radiant Life app. If you do not have the app on your device, go ahead and head on over to your app store, search Radiant Life AZ and download the app today. Head on over to the app and click check in. You'll see the green check mark. Click that box, fill out your information and go ahead and add a photo of yourself. We wanna see what you look like. Now you may be wondering, hey, why do they want my personal information? The reason being is that we wanna know who's here and who's not just so we can be with you in times of sickness, illness, or just if you're on vacation. Now, if you went through the week and if you fought a physical battle, you probably would have went to the doctor if you had your nose broken or something like that. Now, we fight spiritual battles every single day, so what sense does it make for us to come to church on spiritual crutches and not leave without getting our needs met? If you have any spiritual need, go ahead and fill out a connection card today on the Radiant Life app. Now, if, hey, you don't have a smartphone, don't have a smart device, go ahead and raise your hand. Someone from our host member team will give you a paper connection card that you can fill out today. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are happy to have you. Reuniting the world to Christ with a relevant ministry that restores lives in order to establish relationships that radiate with reverence to God. Simple, right? That is our mission here at Radiant Life. Together we can share the love of Christ and live life radiantly. We make giving super easy here at Radiant Life. There are four ways you can give. You can give in person with an envelope on our website at radiantlifeaz.com, download our mobile phone app or text to give. It's easy, fast, safe, and convenient. Try it today. The Radiant Prayer Call happens every Tuesday evening at 6 p.m. with Pastor Joseph Kern. Simply dial 602-638 1177. The corporate prayer call is a great way to stay connected here at Radiant Life Church. Don't miss out on what God has in store for you. That's all we have for this week's Radiant News. If you missed anything, head on over to our website, radiantlifeaz.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week. Enjoy the service. Welcome to Radiant Recharge Family Bible Study with Dr. Joseph Kern. We pray you are encouraged, enlightened, and enhanced as we explore the truths found in God's Word. We are studying the book of Revelation going verse by verse. This is one of the most exciting and anticipated works that I have done. We are going through the whole Bible using the book of Revelation as our text. This is a two-year study divided into six parts. Part one, the seven churches of Revelation. Part two, the seven seals of Revelation. Part three, the seven trumpets of Revelation. Part four, in the middle of the tribulation. Part five, the seven bowls of Revelation. And finally, part six, the end of Revelation. Make sure to download the weekly sermon notes and slides. We have many sermon series and Bible studies that cover every aspect of life, such as health, spiritual warfare, prophecy, and relationships. If you would like to have any of our audio or video products, please visit our store at RadiantLifeAZ.com. Your purchase of these products make it possible for us to continue ministering to people all over the world in a relevant way. Now, let us pray. Father, we ask that you would open our eyes and show us wonders in your word. Holy Spirit, give us 40 vision your word that we may comprehend the breadth, the length, the height, and depth of your love, which surpasses all knowledge. We know that you are able to do exceedingly, 
abundantly above all that we may ask or think according to the power that works within us. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, let's get into God's word. Revelation chapter 9, the fifth and sixth seal. It's going to take me two weeks to do just the fifth seal and then two weeks to do the sixth. And, um, and what you're going to be surprised, you're going to hear things that might shock you today. And you're going to hear things that you need to hear about it because they're about to come upon the earth. They're about, to, and, I, and I, I mean, there's these new technologies that are already existing that you don't know about. I'm going to reveal today. Amen. All right, so you need to be prepared and ready for that. But, you know, let's do the prayer that we pray every week. Because we, without the Holy Spirit, we can't understand any of this. In fact, by the way, chapter 9 is considered by theologians the most difficult passage in all of Revelation. In fact, it's so confusing to them, they don't even try to explain it. I, how do I know? I have all their books. And all they do is they call it the War of the Demons because it's so supernatural. They don't know how to explain it. But I got some answers for you. Amen? So put your hands in your eyes. Say, Holy Spirit, give me 40 vision. In your word, that I might know the heights, the depths, the length, and the breadth of your word. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Come on, high five two people, three people, because we're about to get into the word of God. That means game on. Woo! I'm excited today. The name of today's dialogue is The Fallen Star, Release of the Locusts, and Life Extension Technologies. Now, we need to recap a little bit because some people, this is their first service, and I'm sorry it might be heavy today because we've already been preaching on this since January, and now we're, as you go further, it gets deeper, right? But let me give you a quick review for those who have not been with us. The key to understanding the book of Revelation, there's actually a divine outline given by Jesus in Revelation 119. He says, Write the things which thou hast seen. And in that chapter one, John sees the vision of Christ. And then Jesus says, then write the things which are. And he writes letters, seven letters to seven churches for the contemporary present time. And then he says, write the things which shall be hereafter. Chapters four all the way to 22 is here after the church age. The church will not be here during the great tribulation, during the tribulation. I know there's a lot of people who view differently, but you came to Radiant and I'm the one preaching, Okay. You can still disagree with me. I have no problem with that. But I want you to understand from my 35 years of study, I believe in the pre-trib, rapture, tribulation. I mean, and as we go through the scriptures, you'll even understand even more why I believe that. Amen. Now, that doesn't mean like if you wishy-washy, you automatically go to heaven. Come on, talk to me. I don't determine that. Your neighbor can't determine that. But some people come to church, but they don't really get church in their heart. Come on, talk to me. I think we'll be surprised by the people who are still here after the day after the rapture. Come on, talk to me. So even in the Greek, it says meta tauta, after this, after the church age. So from Revelation 4 to 22 is after the church age. In fact, you can even outline the book of Revelation in sevens. You have the seven churches in chapters 1 through 3. You have the seven sealed books in chapters 4 through 5. You have the seven trumpets, chapters 6 through 7, which we're on right now. You have the seven signs, chapters 8 through 11. The seven last plagues, which is chapters 15 through 16. The seven dooms, chapters 17 through 20. And then you have the seven new things, which is chapters 21 through 22. Now, I'd like to explain to you the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven vials, our bowls of wrath, are 21 distinctive and sequential plagues that come upon the earth. And the reason why I say that, because many theologians believe they're the same ones just described differently. But how do we know they're distinctive and different? Because Revelation 15 verse 1 says, And I saw another sign in heaven, and great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues. In other words, here's seven more. I didn't call them the same thing. So they are sequential. They are distinctive. There's 21 different plagues all together. Three divided are three divided by 21. Three, three times seven. You have 21 total plagues. Now, here's what's interesting. Each successive series, we're talking about the seven trumpets, the seven seals, the seven bowls of wrath. They come out of the last of the former. What do I mean by that? The seventh seal releases the seven trumpets. The seventh trumpet signals the seven bowls. And if you have, you, you should have the outline there so you can see what I'm talking about. I did this, there it is. It's right there and you should have it on your phone so at any time you can go back to that. Now let's recap 
the trumpets we have covered in the last week or two. The first trumpet is the judgment on the earth. One third of the, vegetarian, uh, the vegetation excuse me, is totally burned up. That's Revelation 8, 7. The second trumpet, and this is the wrath of God, you have the judgment on the sea. One third of the sea turns to blood, destroying one third of the fish, the fishing industry, and the ships of the world. That's Revelation 8, 8 through 9. We already covered these. I'm just recapping. We have the third trumpet. That's judgment on the fresh waters. One third of the fresh waters become bitter, according to Revelation 8, 10 through 11. And again, it took us two weeks to cover this. Though what I'm talking, just recapping right now, even though I'm saying it in one sentence. The fourth trumpet is judgment on the heavens. We find that all the luminary lights, the sun, moon, the stars, are dimmed by one third temporarily. That's found in Revelation chapter 8, verses 12 through 13. So now we come to the sixth trumpet, one of the most confusing of, the, uh, of, of understanding to most theologians is the sixth, the fifth and sixth trumpet. So let's hear the fifth trumpet, Revelation chapter 9, verses 1 through 12. Let's hear it. Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottom of the pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke locusts came upon the earth, and to them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth, or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die, and death will flee from them. The shape of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. They had hair like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. And they had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. They had tails like scorpions, and there were stings in their tails. Their power was to hurt men five months, and they had as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, but in Greek he has the name Apollyon. One woe is past. Behold, still two more woes are coming after these things. Even without any interpretation, when that comes upon the earth, it's obviously very scary. It's very, very heavy. In fact, for those, sometimes I get a traffic ticket, for those taking notes, this is the fifth trumpet that we're covering. You might want to make note of that. We are covering the fifth trumpet. Fifth. There's a typo. That's what I'm trying to explain to you. Make sure you know that this is the fifth trumpet. The next two trumpets for many scholars, the ones we're about to cover in the next two weeks, next four weeks really, are so dark, they're so terrifying and difficult to interpret that they have been described by many theologians simply as the war of the demons. Their horror and severity is described in the scripture as two woes, Revelation 8, 13. And behold, I heard an angel flying through the midst of the heavens, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. Look at Revelation 9, 12. One woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. In other words, these new trumpets, these two next ones are so bad, it's another level that a woe comes with them. What is a woe? A woe is a word of judgment. It's a word to express grief, regret, misfortune, or grievous distress where an escape from its repercussions is almost impossible. You can't escape this. That's why they said, whoa, into the inhabitants of the earth. So if, even if I can't describe it in the way the Bible is, you need to know that even God, when he tried to describe it, said, whoa, this is heavy stuff. Okay? So we read that a star falls from heaven... In Revelation chapter 9, verses 1 through 2. What you need to understand is that the Bible is using metaphoric language because even the rules of language tell you that. 
This star is a person. It's not a physical star. It's not a meteorite. It's a person. How do we know that? In verse 1, it says, the scripture says, and the key was given to him. So the star is a him. Again, in verse 2, it says, and he opened the bottomless pit. By the way, the word star in the Greek is the word aster. It's translated star, but metaphorically, even in Greek, in different language, it's used for angel. So, it tells you that this person is a he, and it's an angel. In Revelation 1.20, we're even told by Jesus that seven stars are angels. Look at this. Revelation 1.20, the mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest on my right hand in the seven candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. So even Jesus used the term stars for angels. So when they says a star fell from heaven, it's talking about a fallen angel. By the way, the name Lucifer... Satan's name before his fall in Hebrew of Heliel, it's literally translated morning star. So even his name has the word star in it. So this star, our angel, described in Revelation chapter 9 verse 1 through 2 for all the reasons I just gave, is none other than Satan himself or the formerly known fallen angel as Lucifer. Now I did a whole 16 week study on the fall of Lucifer. I encourage you to go online and get it. But let me just briefly describe his fall. Um, but before I do that, when you look at Revelation 9, 1 through 2, it says, it said, check this out. It says, and I saw a star fall from heaven. It's interesting because in the original Greek text of this Revelation scripture, the word fall is used in the past tense. In fact, other translations have properly rendered this verse, I saw a star which had fallen to the earth. Look at Revelation 9, 1 in the Amplified Version. It says, then the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky. That's the correct tense. So it's talking about something that had happened in the past. So in regards to the event of the fall of this angel, it's something that has already happened in the past. And I'm telling you, that is Lucifer or who is now known as Satan, the poser. Now, I want to explain to you, for because many people don't know a lot about Satan or Lucifer before his fall, but before his fall, he had a very high position. And if I just describe you three of his titles, you begin to understand that it's a lot more than just him singing in heaven. It goes way beyond that. That's why it took me 16 weeks to break down the fall of Lucifer. And, um, in fact, one of his titles, you might want to write this down, is that Lucifer is called a prophet. In Ezekiel 28, 14, it says, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. In the Old Testament, you find that the word anointed is used around with the word, um, 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 with the prophets. Whenever you see the word anointed, it's tied to the prophets. It says, like, touch not my anointed and do my prophets no harm. And you find, and also in Revelation, you can go to, it's not in your notes, but Revel, I'm going by memory. Revelation chapter 12, it talks about how he describes Satan as a dragon who has a tail. And with his tail, he deceived all the fallen angels. He drew a third of the angels. Now, what's interesting, check this out. In Isaiah 9, 15, it describes this. It says, the prophet that teaches lies, he is the tail. Remember, it's his tail with his prophecies deceive the angels. So he's called a prophet. So you need to understand that Satan does have prophetic gifts and talents. And they have not been lost. Why do you think so, there's so many witches and sorcerers and fortune tellers? Because he still has his gift of prophecy. It has been demented. But he has a highly accurate view, if you will. It's faulted and, and, and it's twisted, but that's why he, we just need to recognize that before his fall, he was called a prophet. A lot of people don't realize that. Number two, he also was called a priest. In Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 18, it says, Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore, I will bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. Now notice it says that Lucifer had sanctuaries, or places of meeting for religious services. How many know if you have sanctuaries, that means you're a priest? Wow. So then you begin to go, he was a prophet? Before the fall, he was a priest. He held services. And your next question would be, well, where did he hold those services? It's answered in his third title. The third thing that he's called in the Old Testament is that Lucifer was a king. Notice in, in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 13, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. Okay, right there it tells you where he was. He wasn't in heaven during this time. He was where? On earth. 
he says, and I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. If he had a throne, that means that throne was given to him. That also means if you're a throne, if you have a throne, you're a what? A king. So then you even begin to understand even more that before Lucifer's fall, that he was a king where? On the earth. On the earth. He was king of the earth before. This is before Adam, by the way. Okay. Now, we find later on, I'm just giving you a little overview so you understand what's happening here. Lucifer was not satisfied with his, with his position on earth. In fact, one of the first sins in all of the universe was covetousness, our jealousy, desiring that which just doesn't belong to you. And so he invades heaven to try to take over God's throne. Doesn't that sound ridiculous? But he did try to do it. He was blinded by his own brightness, the Bible says. Let's hear Isaiah 14, 12 through 14 for a second. Let's hear it. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Here's what's interesting. That war didn't last long. Because how many know that Satan is not equal to God? In fact, he fell like, the Bible says, like lightning. Jesus said in Luke 10, 18, and he said unto him, I beheld Satan fall from heaven like lightning. How many know that lightning, boop? How many know all God has to do, boop, you're gone, amen? So it wasn't a long battle. But you need to understand that he was cast out of heaven. Let's look at Ezekiel 28, 15 through 18. Let's hear it for those who've never heard this. perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God. And I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading. Therefore, I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. Now, for those who are new to this, Satan was cast out of heaven, but a lot of people don't understand that there are more than one heaven. There are three heavens. In fact, the first scripture, Genesis 1-1, says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The word is, is, is plural, the heavens and the earth, the shimian, which means plural. So he was cast out of the heaven of heavens, God's throne, but he still has access to the second heaven, which is all the way up to whatever that dimension is, to the third heaven, the stars, the moon. He has access to all that, and also to the first heavens, which is our atmosphere which is why in revelation 12 there's another war him and michael fight and i'm getting ahead of myself and he's now cast out of the second heaven and he's limited to the earth and guess what the bible says whoa unto the inhabitants of the earth for now he knows his time is short he knows he has three and a half years are you hearing what i'm saying now Notice, I want you to notice, he says, he fell because he said, I will be like the most high. The word there is Elohim. It means possessor of heaven and earth. In other words, he wasn't happy with just being the king of the earth. He says, I want to be the most high, which means possessor of heaven and earth. And because of his fall, we find the pre-Adamic destruction in between verses 1 and 2 of Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2. And a lot of you don't know that, but there's, there, there's a destruction between those verses. How do we know? It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Perfect. And then it says in verse 2, it says, and the earth was without form and void. The Hebrew word was is the Hebrew word haya, which means, and it became without form, without void. You go, how does a perfect earth become twisted and, and weird? It's because of the fall of Lucifer, further described in Jeremiah, when God says, by the way, remember when I talked about tohu and bohu, which means without form and void? He says, let me talk about tohu and bohu again, without form and void. And he tells Jeremiah, he takes him back into time, and he says, I see the time, and he sees that 
the destruction was brought on because of the fall of Lucifer. Why don't we listen to it? Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 4. Are you guys finding this interesting? Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 23 through 28. Let's hear this. Listen to this. I beheld the earth, and indeed it was without form and void. And the heavens, they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and indeed they trembled. And all the hills moved back and forth. I beheld, and indeed there was no man. And all the birds of the heavens had fled. I beheld, and indeed the fruitful land was a wilderness. And all its cities were broken down at the presence of the Lord by his fierce anger. For thus says the Lord, The whole land shall be desolate, yet I will not make a full end. For this shall the earth mourn, and the heavens above be black, because I have spoken. I have purposed, and I will not relent, nor will I turn back from it. This is powerful. So in the context, he's saying, he goes back in Hebrew, I saw the earth without form and void. And he says, what, the, the whole heavens went black? He said the cities were destroyed. So do you know that there were cities even before Adam? You understand that, right? And so in between verse 1 and verse 2 is the fall of Lucifer. And because he says the heavens shall be black because of what took place on the earth. So the, all of the universe becomes black. No light. Earth becomes a frozen ball in the midst of the universe, right? And we know this, even scientists tell, tell us that the earth was one time a frozen ball. Here's where we find that if you take all the lights out, everything freezes. And what's the first thing God says when he's ready to re redo the earth? In verse 3 says, let there be what? Light. Why? Because he had turned all the light off. People go, well, people notice, well, he's not creating a sun or moon because it was already there, but it was messed up. So all he has to do is turn back on. Are you following me? It's pretty heavy stuff. Now, I cover this for 16 weeks, but I'm trying to give you, so you understand, this star that fell from heaven, there's a history. Are you hearing me? S Lucifer is now called Satan. His name literally means, Satan means adversary. He's in opposition of all that God does. I'm about to explain to you why he has these keys. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 18 says, Wherefore we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once again, but Satan hindered us. Notice Satan is always opposing the people of God. He opposes God and he opposes his people. In John 10, 10, Jesus talking about Satan called him a thief. He says, the thief cometh not but to steal, kill, and destroy. He opposes everything God wants to do. And so to explain it, why is he still on earth then? Or why is he still around if he's so evil? I put this in writing. God contemporarily and for a limited amount of time is using Satan as a pawn of opposition to allow the people of the world to exercise their God-given right of free will to choose God and his plan of eternal um, life and salvation through his son Jesus Christ or choose Satan, life without God, which is manifested in self-sufficiency and self-indulgence, which leads to eternal death. Without Satan, you have no choice whether you want God or something else. And so temporarily... He's released on the earth so that we can have a choice whether we want God or not. If we didn't have a devil, then how could we choose not to have God? Are you following me? So Joshua 24, 5 says, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose ye this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served, which was the devil. So see, the Bible tells us the devil's here to give you a choice. You want everlasting life with God or do you want to serve the devil? Now, if you want to be someone in between, you're saying, I don't really want to serve God, but I don't want to serve the devil. There's a lot of people probably in this room like that. Well, guess what? Then you've already made your choice. You are serving the devil. Why? Because the number one rule in Luciferism, if you worship Lucifer, there's a lot of people who do. Guess what? The number one rule that they teach you, here's the number one commandment. Do as you will. Do what you want. So when you say, I don't want to serve the devil, but I don't want to serve God. I want to do what I want. You've already became a Luciferian. You don't know it. You've already chosen your side. In fact, you're a Luciferian at the highest level because you're saying, I don't even want to do the devil's so will. I want to do my will. I am God. Revelation 12, 12 says, I don't even know if I'm going to get past one verse. Come on, talk to me. 
Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he know that his time is but a short. He only has a limited amount of time where he's allowed to exist to give you a choice to serve God or yourself. Are you hearing me? Now, this fallen angel is given the key to the bottomless pit. You might want to write this down because I will come back to this. The word pit is the word P-H-R-E-A-R. It's like P-H rear, if you will, freer. It literally translated means a hole in the ground dug for obtaining or holding water or other purposes, a cistern or well. But it can be figuratively, for, figuratively excuse me, used as an abyss, as the prison. Now here's what's interesting. Because doctrinally, the abyss, as a theologian, I know this, is one of the underworlds known as the prison place of demons. So you might want to, so it's likely that what he's opening is actually the prison place of the demons, where demons are imprisoned. We find this interesting because it actually, that word abyss comes from the Greek word abusos, meaning immeasurable depth. When Jesus was casting out legion out of the madman of Gadara, the demons actually begged Jesus to please do not send us into, quote, the deep, but allow them to possess some other local swine. Let's look at Luke chapter 830. And Jesus asked him, saying, what is thy name? And he said, now these are the demons speaking legion, because many devils were entered into him. And they besought him that he would not command them to go into the deep. Underline that word deep. That word is abusos, which means the prison place of demons. So they're saying, don't send us to the prison place of the demons. And it could be very likely in Revelation 9, that's what we're seeing open, the prison place of the demons. By the way, Jesus says, okay, I won't send you to the prison place. Let me put you in, 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 the, in the pigs. So that tells you what he thought of um, pork, right? He is a Jewish man. The abyss is also called destruction. You find it in Job 28, 22, destruction and death. Say, we have heard the fame there with our ears. So it's also known as destruction, the abyss, the holding tank for demons. Now, what's interesting is that it is Jesus who gives this fallen angel these keys. That might be a shock to you. And why? How do I know this? Because Jesus tells us in Revelation chapter 1 verse 18 that he is in possession of the keys to hell and death. Look at Revelation 1 18. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of both hell and of death. So he had the keys. Even after his resurrection, he told his disciples that all power in every dimension was given to him. Where's that? Matthew 28, 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Now, keys are representative of the authority to open and to close doors of operation. So the fact that this fallen angel has keys that belong to Jesus means that Jesus gave them to him. Why? For a temporary use. Jesus temporarily gives these keys to Satan in order to allow him to release havoc and destruction upon the earth that come along with these trumpets of judgments. Did you just hear what I said? Satan already has one level that he can bring on the earth. But during the tribulation, he's given more authority to do things that are far worse. That is so evil that eventually, even in the same chapter, one third of the earth is taken off the planet. I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. So let's talk about the locusts. And he opened the bottomless pit, verse 2, and there arose smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace. And sun and the air were darkened by the reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came to the smoke locusts upon the earth. This is going to take me two weeks, but this is going to be good. When the pit is opened, the sun and the earth is literally darkened by smoke that resembles, according to scripture, quote, the smoke of a great furnace. So it's not actual smoke because the language is figurative, even in the, in the reading. So, but it's, this is a scene that resembles black smoke that darkens the skies. So the scripture is declaring that out of the smoke arises locusts upon the earth. So the appearance of smoke is caused not by actual smoke, but by 
hordes of locusts actually flying in the sky, dimming the sunlight. If you look at the picture from the 1950s, a locust swarm devoured every growing thing for several hundred thousand square miles in the Middle East. And that picture right there you're looking at is from June of 2016. Millions of locusts swarmed the farmlands of, the, uh, of Dagestan, Russia. This is not that long ago. But look at from afar, the scene looks like smoke rising. Do you see that? That's not smoke. That's locusts. The sheer multitude of locusts actually dimmed the daylight of the sun. And that is what is about to come in Revelation 9. But these locusts are different because they have the power to hurt people similar to a scorpion. Notice Revelation 9, 3. And unto them was given power as the scorpion of the earth hath power. Verse 5. Their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. So these aren't normal locusts because they have, locusts don't sting, sting people. Scorpions do. But these locusts have the ability to sting people. In fact, scorpions inhabit warm, dry regions. They have an erect tail tipped with a venomous stinger. A scorpion's victim often rolls on the ground in agony, foams at the mouth, and grinds his teeth in pain. And I'm describing because that's what says happens when these locusts come and attack you. Interesting, because God in the Old Testament would sometimes send locusts to devour the harvest of those under judgment. If you got out of line, God would send locusts to judge you. Deuteronomy 28, 34, thou shalt carry much seed out into the field and shall gather but little in for the locust shall consume it. Verse 42, all thy trees and fruit of thy land shall the locust consume. It's interesting because the eighth plague of Egypt, when Moses was trying to get the people of Israel set free, the eighth plague was a plague of locusts. Look at Exodus 10, 12 through 14. And the Lord said unto Moses, stretch out thy hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts that they may come upon the land of Egypt and every herb of the land, even all that hath hell hath left. And Moses stretched forth his rod over the land of Egypt and the Lord brought an east wind upon the land all that day and that night. And when it was morning, the east wind brought the locusts. Pay attention to uh, um, Exodus um, ten fourteen. And the locusts went up all over the land of Egypt and rested in all the coast of Egypt. Here's the key verse. Very grievous they were. Before them there was no such locust as they, neither after them shall be such. Uh, that's prophetic. So we find that God sent locusts to Pharaoh to make him let go of the people of Israel. And in fact, the scripture says never in history had this, there been a locust infestation like this. But he said also afterwards. So that tells us Revelation 9 aren't physical locusts because it couldn't be as worse that because he said it wouldn't. So it, it can't be physical locusts. Are you following me? Hope you understand that. These are prophetic hints I'm giving you. In fact, the plague of locusts is one of the things that King Solomon at the dedication of the temple, he asked God to please eliminate if his people came to him in prayer and repentance. Look at 1 Kings 8, 37. If there be in the land famine, if there be pestilence, blasting, mildew, locusts, or if there be a caterpillar, if their enemy besiege him in the land of their cities, whatsoever plague, whatsoever sickness there be, he says, Lord, if people come and repent, heal them of these plagues. Now, it's interesting because these locusts were told something very unusual. They do not hurt the vegetation. This is our first clue, maybe our second after I just showed you in Exodus, but in this passage, this is our first clue that these aren't typical locusts. Why? Because locusts usually devour green vegetation. These locusts are actually commanded to not hurt the green vegetation. They're commanded not to. Let me give you other clues that tell us that these aren't insects. This isn't the plague that God sent to Egypt. Locusts do not have skin scorpion-like stings in their tails. That's verses 3 and 5. These Revelation 9 locusts harm only specific people, so they know who to harm and not to harm. That's verses 4 in Revelation chapter 9. In verse 6 to 9, we learn their physical description is unlike any locust. Verse 11, they have a king over them. Now, why is that unusual? Even the Bible tells us, look at Proverbs chapter 30, verse 27. The locusts have no king. Yet they go forth, all of them, by bands. So locusts do not have a king. The fact that these locusts have a king and his name is Abaddon, the destroyer, tells you that these aren't insects. 
This is something else that's so hard. John has seen so far in the future. He has no other words to describe it than to describe them as locusts that have the power of scorpions. Oh, come on. Talk to me. I'm not going to tell you what they are today. That's next week. But I want to set you up. This is why most people won't even try to interpret. They just call it the war of the demons. But to me, it's, it's not that hard to understand. But we're gonna, I'm going to break this down one verse at a time. Are, 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 amen? In the Old Testament, God compared, I'm giving you a hint of what we're seeing here. He compares invading armies of judgment to locusts. Notice Joel chapter 1, 4 through 6. That which the palmer worm hath left, hath the locust eaten. Go to verse 6. For a nation has come upon my land. This is future. So he talks about this future army. That's good. And he says, he calls it a plague of locusts. Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 14. The Amplified. The Lord of hosts has sworn by, him, by himself, saying, Surely I will fill you with men as with a swarm of locusts. Go to verse 27. Prepare and dedicate the nations for war against her. Look at even below. Cause the horses to come up like a swarm of locusts. Judges chapter 6. 1. But the Israelites did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian. This is prophetic. For seven years. Verse 5. And they came like locusts for multitude. Both they and their camels could not be counted, so they wasted the land as they entered into it. I think that's prophetic. Here Israel was given locusts for seven years, and it says it was the Midianite army. And we know the tribulations. How many years? And we see locusts arrive. See, there's nothing new in this. And everything happens in repeated history. Judges chapter 7 verse 12. The Amplified Version. And the Midianites and the Malachites and all the sons of the east lay along the valley like locusts for multitudes. And their camels were without number as the sand of the seashore for multitude. This is in the future. So, I mean, it happened in the past. But we also see in the future in Revelation chapter 9. So I've already, you now know what this is. The Lord said there will never be a plague like in Egypt because those were insects. But there will be a plague just worse, but it won't be insects. It's going to be a what? An army. But when you read their description, there's no army that looks like this army. It's in the future. And you're being prepared by all the movies you're watching for it. You are being so prepared. These locusts are limited in who they can torment and for how long. That's found in verse 4 and 5. Are you guys enjoying this? Okay. First, they are only allowed to hurt those who do not have the seal of God in their foreheads. So they have the technology to know who has a seal. Fascinating. And this, you, I hope you've been here, this only refers to the 144,000 Jews from the 12 tribes of Israel who are sealed by God in their foreheads, Revelation 7, 3 through 8. Look at Revelation 7, 3. It says, hurt not the earth, nor the sea, nor the trees. Remember these locusts are told not to hurt the trees? And till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. So there's 144,000 Jewish, Messianic Jews who believe in Jesus who will be sealed and the locusts cannot touch. Come on, talk to me. You're saying, what about the church? The church is in here. The church is in heaven. Now, those who get saved after the tribulation, they're not sealed in this specific way. You're dead. So those who want to be here for the tribulation, I don't know what you're looking forward to. Only those 144,000 are sealed. The rest, you get saved and you, then you die. You're saying, is that good news? Yes, get saved today so you don't have to be there. Amen. I hope you enjoyed today's broadcast. Join us next week as we continue our study on the book of Revelation, Magnum Opus. Now let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word for it's forever settled in the heavens. And now we ask you, to write your word in our hearts that we might not sin against you. Thank you, Lord, for being with us because we know where there are two more gathered in thy name, that there you are in the midst of them. And Father, I stretch forth my hands towards the people that are watching this broadcast, and I say, Lord, bless them and keep them. Lord, make your face to shine upon them and be graceful unto them. Lord, lift up your countenance upon them and give them peace. 
In Jesus' mighty name, everybody said, amen. God bless. We'll see you next week. We invite you to continue worshiping with us in your giving. Your contributions to this ministry give us the opportunity to reach people, change lives, and make an impact in our city and around the world. At this time, we invite you to give an offering. Look for the Give link at the top of your screen and join us in furthering the mission here at Radiant. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Make sure to stay connected with us throughout the week online at RadiantLifeAZ.com and on Facebook and Instagram at RadiantLifeAZ. We believe that God has something unique to say to you, and our hope is that you feel His love stronger today than ever before. Thanks again for being with us. Have a great week.